Good evening and welcome to all of you here and so far our one friend on Skype tonight. And especially a warm welcome to the several newcomers who are here in person for the first time. This is our weekly Sunday meeting at the United Lodge of Theosophists in London. The ULT is an international association of students of theosophy who are interested in studying, understanding, and sharing with others the teachings of theosophy, the way it was initially, originally presented to the world at the end of the 19th century by H.P. Blavatsky, whose photograph is up there, and her co-founder of the Theosophical Society, William Q. Judge, whose photo is up there. The ULT is not the same as the Theosophical Society. It was founded in 1909 by Robert Crosby, whose photo we have up there on that wall. He had been a member of the Theosophical Society in America and a colleague and co-worker with William Judge. Uh, the original society underwent numerous problems and conflicts and disturbances after the passing of HPB and William Judge and the focus became very much altered and distorted and so Robert Crosby finally felt compelled to start something new to restore the focus to what it had originally meant to be on. You may ask what is theosophy? It literally means divine wisdom from the Greek word theosophia and it's the esoteric teaching which underlies all the world's religions and which is the primeval, archaic source and fountainhead of all the truth that can be found in the various religions, philosophies and sciences of the world. And periodically, some person or persons come onto the scene to present a portion of that wisdom or to provide deeper clarification on aspects of the universal philosophy. And tonight we'll hear about Paracelsus, who was one of such people. And most recently in our times, the one who gave out the greatest amount in the greatest depth and in the most well-attested way was H.P. Blavatsky. So just to let you know about the program of the activities we have here, we have weekly Sunday meetings. The first and the third Sundays are always talks, like today. The other Sundays are reading and discussion groups where we generally sit in a circle and take it in turns to read through parts of an article by either HPB, William Judge, sometimes Robert Crosby, and discuss different points and topics that come up from that. If you don't have a copy of the programme, for April to June, you can find one on the table at the back and downstairs as well, and on the website. And the weekly Wednesday meetings are every Wednesday at 7. Those are an ongoing study class in the Tao Te King, the ancient Chinese wisdom of Lao Tzu, followed by study in the Secret Doctrine, which is the main work by H.P. Blavatsky. That goes from 7 till around half past 8. Then there's a short break of 10 to 15 minutes. Then we reconvene round the table at the back and read and discuss a letter by Robert Crosby in the book The Friendly Philosopher. And some people only stay for the first part of the meeting, others only come for the second part of the meeting. Anyone's welcome to come to whichever part they would like to. All are welcome to all the meetings that we have here. So tonight's talk is The Life of Paracelsus, a Theosophist, and the summary says the 16th century Europe saw a man of great wisdom known as Paracelsus, but who was he? Next Sunday is an article, actually two short articles by William Judge, called Advantages and Disadvantages in Life and the Moral Law of Compensation. And the summary in the program says, Good karma is that kind which the ego, the capital E, which in theosophical terminology means the reincarnating soul, good karma is that kind which the ego, 
not the personality, desires and requires and builds the character. And just to let you know about the rest of this month, the Sunday after that, the 19th, will be the annual ULT Day meeting, which coincides with the anniversary of the passing of Robert Crosby in 1919. And we'll have a meeting called the ULT's Foundations on Sunday the 19th of June with two talks and four readings. And Saturday the 25th of June is our latest quarterly seminar, which will be Mindfulness, Meditation and Raja Yoga. The best path to true meditation is selflessness through a letting go of the shackles of the personal self. And we'll have more information about that near the time. All the work done at the Lodge is voluntary, free of charge. Different students present different topics each week. It's never just one or two speakers. We try to involve as many people as would like to be involved and who feel that uh, they're able to be involved. As it's the first Sunday of the month, we'll read something called the United Lodge of Theosophists Declaration which is the sole guiding document of the ULT. We don't have rules, presidents, bylaws, really anything of an official structure, just one simple document which is mainly derived from statements by HPB and WQJ. And Robert Crosby presented this to sum up what the ULT is about. It says, The policy of this lodge is independent devotion to the cause of theosophy without professing attachment to any theosophical organization. It is loyal to the great founders of the theosophical movement but does not concern itself with dissensions or differences of individual opinion. The work it has on hand and the end it keeps in view are too absorbing and too lofty to leave it the time or inclination to take part in side issues. That work and that end is the dissemination of the fundamental principles of the philosophy of theosophy and the exemplification in practice of those principles through a truer realization of the self, a profounder conviction of universal brotherhood. It holds that the unassailable basis for union among theosophists, wherever and however situated, is similarity of aim, purpose and teaching, and therefore has neither constitution, bylaws nor officers, the sole bond between its associates being that basis. And it aims to disseminate this idea among theosophists in the furtherance of unity. It regards as theosophists all who are engaged in the true service of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, condition or organization and it welcomes to its association all those who are in accord with its declared purposes and who desire to fit themselves by study and otherwise to be the better able to help and teach others. The true theosophist belongs to no cult or sect, yet belongs to each and all. And anyone who at any point may decide that they would like to join, quote-unquote, the ULT, uh, can do so by becoming an associate. We don't normally use terms like member or membership, because the ULT is not really something that one signs up and belongs to, but something that one joins forces with and associates themselves with. It's been described as more of an organism than an organisation. So becoming an associate is free of charge. Nothing is demanded or expected of those who become an associate. It's essentially an independent thing. The person decides for themselves what it means to them and why and when they may want to become an associate. And that's done simply by writing their name and address on the front side of the associates card, which we just read the declaration from. And these are at the back and downstairs as well.
So before we go on to the talk, we have a devotional reading to put us in a contemplative, reflective state of mind. This comes from chapter 4 of the Bhagavad Gita, which is titled, this chapter, Jnana Yoga, or Devotion Through Spiritual Knowledge. Krishna is speaking and says, This exhaustless doctrine of yoga I formerly taught unto Vivasvat. The footnote says, Vivasvat, the sun, S-U-N first manifestation of divine wisdom at the beginning of evolution. Vivasvat communicated it to Manu, Manu being the generic title for the reigning spirit of the sensuous universe, the present one being Vevasvata Manu. And Manu made it known unto Ikshvaku, Ikshvaku the founder of the Indian solar dynasty. And being thus transmitted from one unto another, it was studied by the Rajashis. Rajashis or Rajarishis were the royal sages. Until at length, in the course of time, the mighty art was lost, O harasser of thy foes. It is even the same exhaustless, secret, eternal doctrine I have this day communicated unto thee, because thou art my devotee and my friend. Arjuna, who Krishna is speaking to, replies and says, Seeing that thy birth is posterior to the life of Ikshvaku, how am I to understand that thou wert in the beginning the teacher of this doctrine? Krishna says, Both I and thou have passed through many births, O harasser of thy foes. Mine are known unto me, but thou knowest not of thine. Even though myself, unborn, of changeless essence, and the Lord of all existence, yet in presiding over nature, which is mine, I am born but through my own maya, which means illusion, the mystic power of self-ideation, the eternal thought, in the eternal mind. The footnote says, See also the Varaha Upanishad of Krishna Yajur Veda, which says the whole of the universe is evolved through Sankalpa, thought or ideation alone. It is only through Sankalpa that the universe retains its appearance. I produce myself among creatures, O son of Bharata, Whenever there is a decline of virtue and an insurrection of vice and injustice in the world, and thus I incarnate from age to age for the preservation of the just, the destruction of the wicked, and the establishment of righteousness. Whoever, O Arjuna, knoweth my divine birth and actions to be even so, doth not, upon quitting his mortal frame, enter into another, for he entereth into me. Many who were free from craving, fear, and anger, filled with my spirit, and who depended upon me, having been purified by the ascetic fire of knowledge, have entered into my being. In whatever way men approach me, in that way do I assist them, but whatever the path taken by mankind, that path is mine, O son of Prita. Those who wish for success to their works in this life, sacrifice to the gods, and in this world, success from their actions soon cometh to pass. Dear friends, <coughs> there is um, something profoundly true about um, what uh, Henry Thomas Bacow, an English historian, says in his book, um, The History of Civilization. And I quote him, Owing to circumstances still unknown, there appear from time to time great thinkers who, devoting their lives to a single purpose, are able to anticipate the progress of mankind 
and to produce a religion or a philosophy by which important effect or eventually brought about. But if we look into history, we shall clearly see that although the origin of the new opinion may be thus due to a single man, the result which the new opinion produces will depend on the condition of the people among whom it is propagated. If either a religion or a philosophy is too much in advance of a nation, it can do no present service but must bite, bide its time until the mind of man are ripe for its reception. Every science, every creed has had its martyr or marty. According to the ordinary course of affair, a few generations pass away, and then there comes a period when these very truths are looked upon as commonplaces or common fact, and a little later there comes another period in which they are declared to be necessary, and even the dullest intellect wonder how they could ever have been denied. So I call this because it relates um, to our talk tonight about Paracelsus, which was um, a great thinker, and even more. So, um, the talk today is about, you know, Paracelsus, as we said, and uh, his work, his mission, his life, and his fundamental teaching, and how his work and teachings are part of the greater plan of the Universal Brotherhood, an adept to spread broadcast the teaching of theosophy, or the teaching of the ageless wisdom of the esoteric philosophy, at a time when both religious and scientific materialism prevail. Who was Paracelsus? What was his education? What fundamental teaching did he bring about? Who were his enemies and why? What contribution has his teaching um, brought to humanity in the field of physical science, biology, chemistry, medicine, alchemy, astrology, and so on and so forth? So some of the, some of these are so the questions that come to mind when we think when we come to think uh, about a man known as the greatest occultist of the Middle Ages, Theophratus Bombas von von Ohlheimheim. I'm not sure if I pronounced this name very well. Now known as Paracelsus, was born in the little village of Maria Einsiedeln near Zurich on November. 26, 1493. His father, Willem Bombastus, was a physician and his mother a matron of a hospital. He was the only child. From the earliest moment of his life, Paracelsus witnessed the altruistic service of his parents to the poor and ailing. He also learned the sciences behind his service, namely alchemy, medicine, surgery, from his father. In 1502, when Paracelsus was only uh, nine, years old, nine years old, Elsa, his mother, died, passed away. Father and son moved to another town called Village in Carinthia, where they settled. Paracelsus escaped the orthodox education of the day and nurtured a desire to wander the world in search of truth, for he did not believe that the secret of nature could be told. He thought all art lie in man though not all are apparent. Awakening bring them out. 
To be taught is nothing. Everything is in man, waiting to be awakened. This is what he said. In 1507, he became a traveling student. And at the age of 16, Paracelsus entered the University of Bals. It's B A S E A L. It's Bals. Bals. Basel. 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 I said Basel. Okay. But Baal Basel is both pronounced in French Baal and Basel. German Basel. Yeah, thank you. In 15. Uh, so he entered the university at the age of 16 and gained some practical experience in alchemy. In 1515 he got um, a doctorate, well he, he became a doctor at the University of Ferrara and at the age of 20 he set out of, on his search for a supreme wisdom which took him through every country in Europe and around the world. During these traveling years <coughs> he met he made the acquaintances of great initiate who instructed him into the sacred doctrine of the East. He traveled to India to further his learning and may have visited the Mahatmas in Tibet. He returned to Europe at the age of 32 and became professor of medicine surgery at the University of Basel, where his fearless condemnation of the medical practices then in vogue aroused the jealousy and hatred of his colleague. As, he, as the result of this persecution, Paracelsus resigned his position again and took up a wandering life. Eventually, Paracelsus settled in Salzburg at the invitation of the, um, the Prince of Palatine and died at the end of criminals on September 24, 1541 at age 48 years old. Now we focus, we focus a little bit on his um, work, his teaching and how they correlate to the philosophical teaching or to the Hitler Wisdom teaching. Paracelsus was a prolific writer and wrote many books, over 106 books he wrote on different subjects, philosophy, alchemy, surgery, medicine, astrology, and so on and so forth. In an article published by Mr. Judge in the Path for April 1887, he says Paracelsus was one of the greatest masters ever known upon the earth. In rank, he may be compared with Hermes, thrice master. It is considered by some students to be likely that at this, at this period, 1887, he was once known, he who was once known as Paracelsus is in the body whose astral meets with others in Asia. The enemies of Paracelsus censor him for his nomadic life, which he explained by saying, we must seek for knowledge where we may expect to find it. He who wants to study the book of nature must wander with his feet over the leaves. Every part of the world represents a page in this book and all the pages together form the book that contain a great revelations. He was also condemned for refusing to affiliate himself with any religious sect and for his frank criticism of the Roman Church. Paracelsus denounced public prayers, church going, the, the genuflection, bowing, and observance of church rules, the running after saint, as all these things were opposed to the self-reliance which was the keynote of, this, of his philosophy. He took no part in the Reformation, although he openly, he openly expressed his approval of Luther. It means Martin Luther, the, the father of Protestant Reformation, which was German. The 106 books of Paracelsus, which were collected by Dr. Johannes Ust Uzer, 
show that Paracelsus must have possessed a knowledge of the laws which govern the evolution of the physical, astral, psychical, and intellectual constituent of nature and of man. Paracelsus himself declared that true wisdom is not confined to books, nor to any particular period of history, as the eternal wisdom is without a time, without a beginning, and without an end. But in this day, he says, all wisdom comes from the East. In making his statement, he spoke with an authority, authority born of personal experience. He was himself a member of that fraternity of Adept known as the Brothers of the Snowy Range. He described these teachers, saying that some of them lived like normal men in their physical bodies, while others became transformed and disappeared in such a manner that nobody knew what became of them, and yet they remain on earth. These, of course, are the new Manakayas. The adept living in his physical body is given a definite name by Paracelsus, such a person being master of heaven and earth by means of his free will is called a magus. Therefore, magic is not sorcery, but supreme wisdom. HPV echoed this in the Sacred Doctrine, Volume 1, page 266. 263, when she says that magic is the knowledge of all the primary causes and the ultimate essence of every element of its lives, the functions, properties, and condition of change, and those constitute the basics of magic. Paracelsus was perhaps the only occultist in Europe during the last century since the Christian era who was versed in this mystery had not a criminal hand put an end to his life years before the time allotted by nature. Physiological magic would have fewer secrets for the civilized world than it is now, than it now has. And Paracelsus says that this wisdom, wisdom can be acquired in but one way. It comes only to those abandoning self, sacrifice themselves in the spirit of wisdom, those who seek truth for their own benefit and gratification will never find it. But the truth find those in whom the delirium of self disappears and it becomes manifest in them. Although the philosophical doctrine of Paracelsus sprang from the same source as modern theosophy, a difficulty arises from the differences in the term used. Where HPV used chiefly Sanskrit terms, Paracelsus coined world on his own to express the same ideas. He used, for instance, the word Magnus Limbus, or Wilister, Eilister, to describe the great matrix of cosmos in which the universe existed in a condition of potentiality before the period of manifestation. I suppose this is what theosophy called um, Akasha, or, or yes. abstract, abstract, absolute, abs, abs, absolute abstract space. Alisa, Aliasta, Magnus Limbus. So he used the word Magnus Limbus and Aliasta to describe a great matrix of cosmos in which the universe existed in a condition of potentiality before the period of manifestation. He compared this matrix to a nursery in which the seed of the universe was germinated, describing the condition of the universe at that time as similar to the heat contained in a pebble or the potential figure existing in a block of wood. With manifestation, Aliasta divided the self, developing within itself the mysterious magnum of primordial matter. This expressed itself as one as vital, vital activity and invisible spiritual force, and two as vital matter, the basis of all form. 
So I guess this is what the um, philosophical teacher is talking about, Purusha and Prakriti. So as Alyasta dissolved the third power of the supreme cause, he rose, linking spirit and matter into an indissoluble all, all HPB called this third power for what? Paracelsus gave it the name of Ares. Paracelsus saw spirit and matter present in every form and would not admit the existence of dead matter. There is nothing dead in nature, he affirmed. Everything is organic and living, and therefore the world appears to be a living organism. There is nothing corporeal which does not possess a soul hidden in it. There exists nothing in which is not hidden principle of life. This principle of life, he said, moves slowly in the mineral kingdom. In plant and animal, it moves rapidly. But there is life in every form, from the lowest to the highest. Paracelsus stressed the underlying unity of nature as a whole, as well as the entire relationship and interdependence of all of its parts. If we lose um, nature being the universe is one, he says, and its origin can only be the one eternal unity. It is an organism in which all things harmonize and sympathize with each other. It is the macrocosm. Man is the microcosm. And the macrocosm and microcosm are one. This he says in his book, Philosophia of Athenians. This unity of man and nature makes man the focal point for which the three world of nature, the physical, astral, and spiritual, manifest themselves. These three worlds are made up of a vast quantity of beings or lives. Some of the lives are intelligent, others unintelligent, and it is man's duty to understand the nature. The ignorant man may be controlled by the lower lives, but the true philosopher has learned how to control them by the power of supreme creator within himself. Man's first task, therefore, is to know himself. He must become acquainted with the complexity of his own nature. But in pursuing this study, he must never for a moment separate himself from great nature of which he is a copy and a part. Try to understand yourself in the light of nature, he says, and then all wisdom will come to you. Paracelsus divided man in two parts, then into three, and finally into seven distinct principles. Man is a twofold being, he says. He has both a divine and an animal nature. After making this point clear, Paracelsus taught a triple division, declaring that both man and the universe are composed of three substances, which are the three form or mode of action in which the universal prim primordial will manifest itself and which it symbolizes as salt, sulfur, and mercury. The first substance represents the physical body, the second refer to the indwelling, energizing nature, the astral man. The third substance is the intelligence, the, the intelligence, the indwelling God, the spirit, which is above the other two. When these three substances are held together in harmonious proportion, health is the result. The disharmony constitutes disease. <coughs> the disruption spells death. Physical science deals with the physical, and metaphysical science with the astral man. But these sciences are misleading and incomplete. If we lose sight of the existence of the divine and eternal man, after establishing, after establishing the fundamental idea of the threefold nature of man, Paracelsus then subdivided these three parts into seven distinct principles, as it is on the board there. There are seven elementary power or principles, four lower ones belonging, belonging to the mortal and changeable things, and a trinity of celestial power, which is also called the quint essential. 
The four lower principle can in no way interfere with the quint as essential. He then analyzed this seven principle beginning with the lowest or the elementary body. This body, he declared, is derived from the element and will return to them after the death of the body. It has no power of its own as is commonly supposed. The power of sight does not come from the eye. The power to hear does not arise in the ear, nor the power to feel in the nerves. On the contrary, it is the spirit of man who sees through the eye, ears through the ear, and feel the means of the nerves. So this is what the philosophical uh, teaching says about the reincarnating ego, the permanent reincarnating individuality, the higher ego, which is called manas, or higher manas. He boldly challenged the materialistic concept that mind is a product of the brain by declaring wisdom and reason and thought are not contained in the brain, but they belong to the invisible spirit which fills through the heart and thinks by means of the brain. All these powers become manifest through the material organ. The material organ determine the mode of the manifestation. The second principle called prana or jiva in modern philosophy is described by Paracelsus as the archaeus or liquor vita. So here in the book, um, in, um, in one of the book of, um, of Paracelsus called the Generatio Ominis, we try to compare the term from the from the philosophical uh, teaching about the human constitution with that. Um, and uh, it says it's universal, we say it's universally pervasive. Um, so we are talking about the life principle, yeah, the jiva, the prana. So we says it's a universally pervasive, the all of the principle. It is the ocean um, in which in macrocosm, sorry, I'm just reading. So it says, um, this life principle is universal and not the property of any individual. During the life of an individual, it acts in him as a unity. When the form is broken up at death, it begins to manifest itself in other forms. The life which is active in a man during his lifetime in causing the organic function of the body will manifest its activity in creating wounds in his body after the spirit has left the form. During the life period of the physical body, this universal life principle needs an instrument or vehicle. More than philosophy calls this vehicle the astral body. Paracelsus will describe it as the sidereal body. So the astral body is the guiding model for the physical one. In Paracelsus terminology it says the astral body is the invisible man which is formed in the shape of the outer one as long as it remains in the outer and so on and so forth. So Paracelsus divided um, the human position in seven as it, as it, it shows on the, on the, on the board. There is a lot about how we describe those different principles and what they do, their functions, and uh, and so on and so forth, which I want to go through. I want to go through, but I will just leave that because it's quite lengthy. Lengthy. So, uh, but if we get to acquaint ourselves with what is on the board, we might as well understand what um, Paracelsus is trying to teach us here uh, about the constitution of men, the three higher and the four lower, lower principles. So we can see that um, the uh, teaching of Paracelsus is very uh, much uh, in harmony with 
the um, teaching of theosophy. Um, he, he, he worked um, hard by being a very prolific um, um, writer and also he, he fought the, um, the church um, because of the dogma and the prejudice and the superstitions and the um, misleading teaching that the church was um, holding onto at that time and even now. Well, why was he born when he was in, in that particular uh, period of European history? Because um, uh, there was a lot of resistance uh, officially from all the, the church, uh, the, the academia, uh, society uh, against his or to his his teachings, and he was quite a radical. So, was there a reason why he, he came at that time? Um, in, as a turning point in European history, perhaps? Yeah, surely. Um, <coughs> according to the law of, um, of universal periodicity, and also according to what we read in the, in the Bhagavad Gita earlier on, um, where Krishna says, I produce myself amongst creature, and wherever there's a decline of virtue and a rise in vices and misconception and dogma and creeds, I bring myself forward to, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a human form to, to, um, to, to, to dispel, to, to educate the mind of the race, um, uh, to, to help them um, you know, understand the path to true spiritual perception and to, to rid themselves of, of prejudices and, and bigotry and, and um, you know, all those things that you know about what the uh, Christian church uh, at the time which has power over, you know, the control over the, uh, the society. So, uh, like HPB, we could say, it came um, to, for that mission, basically, uh, to teach men medicine, to, uh, to, to, true to, medicine. to, to educate true. humanity. Mm -hmm. True arts of healing. Yeah, and the art of healing and all the rest of it, yes. Because he, he was principally a physician. Yes. Uh, uh, rather than a, well, a physician and philosopher. Yes, sir. Do you know the film Douglas Baker, a well-known contemporary? Have you had to pass away Douglas Baker? Not have heard of him. Have you heard of Douglas Baker? I have, and yeah. he, he died about two years ago. Yeah, he made a film about Paracelsus. I've seen part of it. Do you know about the film? No, I don't. I'm, I'm Anybody sorry. know about Douglas Baker's film about the life of Paracelsus? He did. He, I've heard him speak. He passed away, as they just said. Yes, he, an excellent film. He's where made. did you see it? Uh, some years ago. I don't know. I saw all of it. Well, where? It, where? I no. think it was his office, the major's his office or something. Okay. He's, he's got a DVD of it, which you could probably buy online. You may get little snippets of it on YouTube. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for this. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know about it. I think we'll have a look into it. Any more? Question or comment? He was a great figure. Um, he actually um, influenced a whole range of other figures like Messmer, okay. other ethnic terrorists of the 19th century, okay. and Madame Vatsky, and he still is in his own today. He's um, continuing influence, so it's worth knowing about. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. Any more question, comment? Anybody want to ask questions on the on, on Skype about Paracelsus and his life, his work, his mission? Yes. You mentioned, and I think you were quoting also from the secret doctrine that his life <laughs> came to an end prematurely. Yes. Because people put an end to his life. Yes. Is it actually known who did that or in what circumstances he died? Um. I'm not sure about the details of his death, but apparently he got um, attacked by some criminals when he was walking somewhere, I think he was coming from somewhere, and he, they, broke, they broke his skull. And I think he died of that, I think, after. That's, that's all I heard, but that's probably something that was also, uh, um, uh, how can I say, 
premeditated fa or fabricated by your by the church or the by the church or the um, its enemy of, the, of that time, basically. So, yes, please. Okay, we've got a comment from uh, a question from Sky. Uh, nothing corporeal which does not possess a soul was quoted, was said. Nothing corporeal that does not possess a soul. Can we have a few more words about what possesses a soul and is not a human? Question mark. Okay. Can you read this, this again slowly for me? Uh, nothing corporeal which does not possess a soul was said. Okay. Um, okay, and then? Uh, can you say a few words about what possesses a soul and what is um, not human? Okay, I suppose was the question is really that um, well, we, we mentioned about the animal um, animal um, uh, the animal instinct or the animal part of, of, of man. So man is, as we said, man was at one time uh, mindless, so he, would, he did not have the manners, so the lighting of manners came after, um, you, know, at, 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 you know, I think it's the third world race, middle of first world race, when the lighting of manners came. Um, so basically, man was mindless, and then the, um, the father of, of, of humanity, the, 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 the Manasa Putras, um, incarnated into man to give him self consciousness. So in that, in that sense, um, you know, man, uh, as we know, you know, now possessing manners uh, is different from man who was man at the time when he was mindless, basically. I'm not sure if that's what he's pointing out, but that's why I thought, yeah, yeah. he's said something first, sorry. Yeah, just one more question. Uh, how does Paracelsus see the all-pervading love? <coughs> The all pervading life. Life. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, I think uh, <coughs> this is it the same. It sees this in the same light as uh, as Telosophic it sees it. Says um, there's but one life, one life which is uh, universal and all pervasive, and it pervades all. And as he says, there's no dead matter in the universe that all is life. Yes, you wanted to ask a question. Well, I was going to say that the way I understood the question before that, that okay. I read out, was that in the talk you mentioned Paracelsus said um, there's no dead matter, everything is organic and alive. Yeah. Every body of any kind in any kingdom possesses a soul. So maybe the question is what type of soul is that? as you described about the human soul, yeah. that what do we mean if we say that in the mineral kingdom or vegetable kingdom or animal kingdom there's a soul? Yeah. Because it's different. So yeah. Yeah, I suppose, um, yeah, I mean, as I said again, I, I specified that the, the, uh, we said that there's, uh, there's, there's the, the lower, um, the lower manas, which is the animal soul, and the animal soul, as we say here, <coughs> the principle, but so in the evolution of mankind of humanity, we at one time we were at that stage and then we evolved what well, we call the manas, which is the higher. So when we're talking about the animal or the, the, the human soul, we talk about self-consciousness, whereas when we talk about the lower, the lower kingdom have doesn't have self-consciousness, so they have, must have some sort of intelligence, some sort of form of intelligence. But most importantly, I think it's the potentiality of that universal um, uh, that universal principle which resides and is stored in, in all form of life, basically. But, um, but the, so the animal soul is, is, is basically um, uh, an incipient human soul, I could say, so, so to speak, or uh, the blunt soul. It's not the same, but, but it, it is in potentiality. Um, the same, but it's evolved into a different, different stage of living. Yes. Hello. So, uh, could one say then, or that basically, none of nature has a soul. Uh, 
um, all of nature is a soul, but incipient in some levels and active in unity. That's correct. So I mean, we need to, I, I suspect, get rid of this notion of we have this or we have that, but that we are to begin with. Yeah, we we are essentially we are essentially and fundamentally we are souls. Um, potentially we are souls. Um, some are some are, <clears throat> yeah. So we develop them. We, we we evolve those principles that are within within us potentially and within everything potentially. You mentioned uh, when you you defined the trinity of um, uh, body, soul, and spirit. You mentioned the uh, the inner indwelling, uh, animating, uh, invisible animating principle, yes. which is well is is the astral the astral form really, yeah. and all the kingdoms in nature have have that. Um, um, But once we go beyond, obviously, the, the plant kingdom, we, uh, you know, animal soul and then human soul, it's some, um, uh, the principle of consciousness comes into it. But it said, uh, everything is conscious in, in, in nature. Every, everything, even the stone, stones have, co have a consciousness of some kind, some level. <clears throat> and of course, as you said, everything has the potential to evolve Uh, the higher principles. Yes. Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Like this, um, yes. Yeah, could you say a, a little more about um, the medical uh, ideas that Paracelsus held? Yeah. Because I understood that he thought every doctor should have a knowledge of uh, ast astrology. Yes. Could you say something about how he saw astrology being used in medicine? Um, yes, I'm trying to see. Um, well, he did say that astrology, uh, as commonly believed to control the lives of mankind, it doesn't really control the lives of mankind, but really... Um, 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 the influences, yeah, or the it's an influence that we can use for for um, our own growth, rather than thinking that it's you know that the stars control our life and stuff, and that we can actually use um, you know the constellation and the position and the the, 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 the um, qualities and properties to um, help release. Um, element as well. I'm not mm -hmm. sure the, the correct idea way uh, we should point out, you put out for them. Yes. Well, I think he suggested that those qualities and potencies of herbs and, yeah, yes. and, and um, different remedies depended very much on the astrological uh, influences. Right. And that, you know, one one herb may be good for a particular disease uh, at a particular time, but in a couple of weeks, it may not be the same, you know, because things will have changed astrologically. Mm. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, didn't he, uh, I'm not sure about this uh, question, did he um, map out the body to correlate, the organs to correlate with particular Thanks. I think he did. Um, I'm not sure which book is it in. Was it in the. Um, I'm not sure if it's actually in this book. Um, yeah, he also, you know, one thing I thought about is that he discovered the nitrogen and um, mapped, you know, those. Um, um, uh, substance into, into, into the. Uh, Um, the different organs of, of human being, you know, that, and how the correspondence, map the correspondence as well. Um, I know there's a, 
I'm not sure if it's in this book or in one of the book. Uh, I think it's probably one of the book written on on his life. Um, it's, I think there's a schematic uh, mapping of, of those uh, those correlation and which he thinks is very important in, in medicine. You know, there's some medicine and healing art. So yeah, I agree. Yes, please. Yes, please. In the entry for Paracelsus and the Theosophical Glossary, it says Paracelsus was a symbolic name that he adopted. I was wondering uh, what that name means or symbolizes. Right, okay. If you know. Apparently, he says that somebody is called Celsius. Um, uh, somebody called Celsius. I'm not sure who is Celsius. Who is it's an ancient Roman doctor. Yeah, called Celsius. Santara means above or That's greater right. than. I, I then, can answer then, if you want. Then, okay, uh, please. Okay. Parakitos in Greek is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. Okay. So, uh, so it is a, a sort of anagram for Paracletos. Paracletus, so Paracelsus. I think. Well, yes, yeah, so probably, yeah, but there was another story that Celsus he, wasn't actually he, he a was, Roman he loved, doctor. He loved... And he uh, saw himself as being greater than Celsus. Yeah, Celsius. Uh, a greater doctor. That's but uh, what we're discussing really about the healing arts here uh, is connected with the law of correspondences. Yeah. You know, that, um, you know, that um, there's a correspondence between, uh, you know, all the plants and herbs which grow on the earth. Uh, and they all um, relate to a particular planet or star. And it, there's a saying, he may have said it himself, for every herb in the, or flower in the field, there's a, a star in the sky. Yeah. And it's so that, <coughs> and of course, the human being, at least certainly ast on the astral level, is connected with the planets and the stars. <coughs> so it's... It also comes back to the notion of microcosm and macrocosm. Oh, sorry. Is it, is it, is it, we're working with universal forces, cosmic forces, uh, as well as earthly, uh, uh, earthly substances and, yeah. and their properties. Yeah, I think he used to say that man is, <coughs> man is, man is a sun, a moon, and a, a heaven full of stars. In himself. In himself. A little universe in himself. Yeah. In himself indeed. So. But also, there's, those, there's a, another aspect of Paracelsus where, <clears throat> because he was a Catholic, and uh, <clears throat> he really fought, and you know, went on the street to really preach the mass about how erroneous the priest, <clears throat> what he called the priest crew, the, the priesthood was, and um, <clears throat> And try to teach them that they, you know, believing that you know uh, that salvation was not cannot be gained for all the, the belief in a historical Jesus Christ and uh, <clears throat> in the money seeking church. And uh, I think for that he was quite despised by the <clears throat> um, by the authority and the church <clears throat> in particular um, at that time. So. As well as being a physician, he took he took up he took himself to the streets actually to preach the true um, Christian doctrine, you know, which is the universal doctrine, the the ageless wisdom. The time, yes, please. Anybody want to ask a question again or oh. comment? Yes, please. Um, uh, he's a past life of somebody, isn't he? Like a master or. I hear several people say that they've passed lives of Paracelsus. Dr. Spaker being one, and I think one of the masters, I don't know. Do you know I think I think he is a master. I mean, like we said here, he's, um, let's say he, he is part of the um, the great fraternity, the great brotherhood of Snowy, the white Snowy um, uh, man. So he's part of the great plan of, of, of you know, Spread broadcasting and uh, teaching, so he is definitely a master. But you don't know, do you know the, what the reincarnation is? Oh, is no, 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 I wouldn't know. Oh, I mean, okay. And this is also something probably they come in, if mm -hmm. it's true, master doesn't come around and say, I was a master at this, or I was a master at this, like in my past life, and stuff like that. But yeah, definitely a master. 
for the life he laid, the, 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 his teaching, he lives, <coughs> the way he lives his life very humbly, in a very humble way, and um, you know, with a lot of hard work. It's quite similar to the way um, HPB lived her life as well. You know, he traveled all over the world. Um, yeah, so, yes. There's um, a new handout available here on the table at the back and down the stairs called Original Theosophy and Later Versions. And one of the sections in it is about the Masters. And it points out that in the original Theosophy that HPB and William Judge presented, they never once say who the Masters were in previous lifetime or give details about it these adepts, apart from saying that they exist and occasionally giving the mystical names by which some of them are known now, such as Master M and Page, mm -hmm. but that in the later presentations of theosophy that became completely different and Christianized and corrupted, people like C. W. Leadbeater, Annie de Sant and Alice Bailey gave lots of details saying this master had all these previous past lives and describing what the masters supposedly looked like, where they lived, what clothes they wear, and things like that. So it's pointed out as being one of the key differences between the original philosophy and later versions is that the original takes an impersonal, respectful approach because it doesn't benefit us at all to know who, who a master was in their past life. Yeah. The masters themselves don't tell us. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point actually because, um, you know, people are not into, you know, we don't want the publicity and uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the real, you can see this is the real, um, this is a way, you know, the subtle way of knowing the true teaching really, I mean, you know, you know to stay away from publicity, to stay away from propaganda and, uh, you know, just focus on the work, focus on, you know, on, on the teaching. Um, and um, and that's the most important thing, you know. Um, a question. Yes. Um, often, uh, Jacob Burma and Paracelsus are spoken of together as part of an impulse um, of, of study and of the lodge. In your study, uh, to put together your talk, did you come up with anything that might have indicated some connection of the one or the other? I believe they were both Swiss. Yeah, or uh, German. Um, Boehm, Boehm, Jacob Boehm, I think, is German, isn't he? Um, yes. He is. was a shoemaker and uh, but a great mystic um, scholar who, who brought to the world the, um, the esoteric philosophy, same as, same as um, <coughs> Paracelsus. I'm not sure if they were contempor contemporary. Um, Jacob Boehm was, was a bit later, a couple yeah. of generations later. But yeah. it's interesting that the next generation after Paracelsus, we have another great uh, master of figure, um, uh, mm, you know, a physician, philosopher, and astrologer, Nostradamus, mm. who, who lived mostly in, in uh, France. And he used um, a lot of, his medicine was quite considered very radical at the time. He, he used what we'd call today homeopathic and herbal remedies. Uh, but he also um, combined that with astrology, and of course he he developed a, a high degree of clairvoyance, and um, and of course we have his famous prophecies uh, today, that, uh, um, in, in, where he made um, predictions for hundreds of years ahead of his time, a lot of which have actually come true. Was he earlier? No, but the next generation after Paracelsus, okay. late um, or mid mid to late sixteenth uh, century. Okay. But he he was actually nearly put to death by the Inquisition for his um, for his beliefs. <coughs> but he was saved by uh, was, um, the Queen of France, who was a uh, Medici, uh, because she um, she took him under her wing and uh, protected him. So. Um, Yes. That's interesting you mentioned about uh, the Lord Dunst. There was another great figure too, Campanella, who spent many years. He wrote an utopian book, The City of the Sun, 
he spent many years in a Polygon dungeon. He got out of there and was depicted by Cardinal Richelieu, whom he praised. Okay. Campanella, a little bit like um, uh, what's his name, Manu, went to Nostradamus. Right. Have you heard of Campanella? Anybody heard of Campanella? No. no. He was I haven't heard from him, no. <laughs> Thank you for that. Any more questions? Any more question or comment? Why are we talking about processes today? <laughs> you know. well, actually, HPB in, in the ISIS unveiled and SD uh, provides many references yeah. to Paracelsus and to mm -hmm. an, another figure called Van Helmont, mm -hmm. uh, who's another uh, alchemist uh, uh, physician of a similar theory. So, um, um, and of course, she compares his teachings with, with theosophical teachings, which, which largely correspond. But what was interesting about Paracelsus is that he, he was a very original. He actually created this, his own terminology, yeah. from the Latin roots or Greek roots, to, for things which, which are quite arcane or occult, I mean principles yeah. uh, in nature. And, uh, so, yeah. Sometimes it can be difficult to actually match up the the terminology. Yeah, that's what I was saying to me yeah. already in the yes, please. Most, if not all, great teachers have close co-workers and disciples. And I may be mistaken, but was Van Helmont a disciple of Paracelsus, or if not, who who were Paracelsus' most trusted proteges? It's a good question. Um, I've now heard about one, um, or maybe I have, but I'm not sure if he was a close associate to, with Paracelsus. Um, all I know is in his later life, he lived in Salzburg, and, uh, but I've, I, haven't, I don't have any recollection of having, him having like a... <coughs> Like someone to, you know, colleague or like an associate or. He did have a protege or a disciple, but I think uh, he was betrayed by by this young man that they, it didn't work out in the end uh, for various reasons. But what is interesting to I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, uh, in the German-speaking countries. Uh, whenever uh, medical students have to study the, te uh, med the teachings or the, the um, medicine of Paracelsus in, in universities, when they study medicine, uh, but only in the German-speaking countries, apparently, I'm not, um, not elsewhere, because elsewhere he's not officially recognized as a, a true physician, or in the, some, he, he was described as a um, uh, well, denigrated as bomb, being bombastic, you know, this Theophrastus bombast from, from Holmheim. Yes. The, that he was a, a boaster and a, a, a charlatan. Some people uh, accused him of being a charlatan. Yeah. But obviously they were his enemies. He was, he was a charlatan, yeah. Yes, please, yeah. Well, perhaps it's only me, but I, um, I don't see Paracelsus as being a, a, a theosophist as such. Um, Jacob Bowman much more than him, much more than uh, definitely okay. than um, Paracelsus. Uh, can you give us a, a trait or a particular? Because a uh, person never came across this one. I mean, I never come across any of his uh, principles, shall we say, other than being, you know, famous for medicine and discovering the nitrogen and, 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 and being part of that, um, you know, the Renaissance, the, the, you know, the, the classic, the, 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 the discovery of the classic, and therefore the chemical movement, you know, with Ficino and uh, many others too. Uh, but at least I don't see him. Uh, There's a lot of quotes. You can give There's us, a um, lot of quotes and a lot of references about Paracelsus in the Isis on the L and uh, in the sacred doctrine about um, how great uh, or no cultures it was um, at that time. And uh, even uh, George did mention him as um, 
you know, as one of the greatest masters, and, and, and um, you know, his teaching clearly shows that all the, you know, although he worded them in a different, um, in a different way, shows that he's very close to what uh, the age of wisdom teaches. I forgot to say that perhaps his most famous, both to me, to me anyway, to be um, a more agnostic than a, because the description he gives of the, um, you know, the element, the, the elemental and that particular world and, and in some great details. I don't know, how, that's the only thing I read on, uh, you know, the only thing I could read because it's, it's some other stuff I have to just see in Italian, so it's incomprehensible. Well, there's this book, there's this book, yeah, which is very interesting, I'm not sure if you can find it anywhere, but it's called The Life and Soul of Paracelsus, which is written by John Agrave. If you read this and you come back, then we can talk about if it was a great tale of his or not. Who's, uh, who's just agreed? What's his name again? Um, John Agrave. John uh, Agrave. John Agrave, yeah. Uh, the life and soul of Paracelsus. Yeah, but who is John Is he a contemporary writer or an old Oh, you mean John Agrave? Yeah. Um, I think I think that you you have to um, read a bit more about him on, online and find out. Like the book was written in 1960. Yeah. So, it's, um, yes, another question, please. Yeah. What do you think, just in a sort of just to sum up, was his real mission? Because if he was a, a representative of the Lodge of Masters, he would have come with a particular. Um, aim and, and role at that time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what was the legacy that he left behind? Uh, very good, very good question, actually. Um, he did not create any set or, as you say, he did not live behind any, he didn't create his own set or um, any uh, school, school, school or people. school or anything like that. Um, but it it did at the time. We must remember that the, the the spirit, because this is this is this is for me. This is how I see that somebody is really working for um, uh, and personally and universally, you know, for a cause that is greater than word can express really 